Okay, um, let's see. I think we've got everybody here. Uh, okay, so uh, the test, uh, if you haven't picked up your tests, the TAs uh, will have them. Um, I think they're going outside to the outside up front there, right? So you can follow them. Um, okay, what was the test score? Let me just go quickly through this. Um, this was the grade distribution. What were the statistics? The max was a 90, the low was a 28. The average, as I said, was going to be in the 60s. It was a 68.7. The median was a little higher. Um, what does this mean as far as how you did in here? If the, if the uh, median was a 71, okay? If you got a 71, are you failing the class? No. What are you getting if you got a, what is your average score if you got a uh, 71? I didn't hear that. What was that? B minus. B minus, right? And uh, what am I concerned about? Okay. This is kind of the curve. I'm concerned about the people out here. Okay. These are the ones that uh, if you got in the th 20s or the 30s, or the even even the low 40s, okay? I am, you know, you need to be, find a way to do better. Um, what does, how do you do better in here? Again, we'll talk about it. One is to, um, well, one is you've got to obviously study harder. You've got to come to class. I noticed that obviously it's not, um, what you call it, the class is not as full today as it was when I gave the midterm. And my guess is that the papers that are in the pile that haven't been picked up yet were on average not as good as the papers that were picked up, okay? Um, it means you got to do better on the homework. It means you got to go talk to the TAs. If you're in this range, this is where uh, I, I have concern, okay? Any questions about that? Uh, I'll go through the test, but... Um, but again, some people may have leveraged, um, again, in here, sometimes, you know, if you had taken a data structures class, you would have gotten some points on the exam. So the people out here, you know, didn't add too much over what they would have gotten on a data structures class. Okay, what was the other thing? Again, when we grade the test, we have various checks in here to see was the test sensible, okay? And one of the... the um, checks is, did the written parts of, of the test correlate with the um, multiple choice parts of the test? And this shows a strong linear relationship. The correlation was 0.51 actually. So, um, so, you know, so there's a relationship between the two parts. You expect some level of variance, okay? We checked um, certain, you know, we, we, we try to do a careful job of grading the test, okay? Um, because, you know, I, I, I offer very limited regrading of tests, which I will talk about. I'm going to go over the test. Basically, the multiple choice part, there's no regrading because the machine presumably did it right, okay? And we checked answers and we're happy with the answers that we gave. Um, on the written parts of the test, I only go through and I tell my TAs only to give extra points if somebody has a correct answer. Okay, if there's a correct answer that we marked off wrong, meaning it deserved full credit and we just didn't understand it, that's something I will give points for. If you tell me, look, it wasn't perfect, but I deserved more points than what you got, that does not get any points. And I will encourage the TAs to look more carefully if they're, perhaps they gave too many points, okay? But I don't, I don't have any, you know, my belief is that it, it's an unbiased thing, the grading errors. We make mistakes, everybody makes mistakes, but it becomes a biased thing if the people who are loudest get more points than the people who are not louder, okay? That's why I only give points for, on regrades for correct answers, okay? So now, how can you figure out if you have a correct answer? Well, let's go and discuss the problems and, on the exam and see if, um, you know, if, if there's any debate about it. Okay, any questions? Okay, the first part was uh, 
quite routine, obviously, to grade. For every pair of functions, either it's, it's uh, you know, none of, none of the two of them on the first part were the same. One side is bigger than the other. That determines the, the big O. Um, is there any one of these that is confusing to people on the first part? And on the second part, you've got to put them in order. Um, it looks like, uh, you know, uh, uh, among these, you know, the exponential one, which is the third one, is obviously the biggest of the bunch. The log of an exponential is going to be something like n. It's like linear, okay? Um, and, uh, you know, so uh, presumably n squared is next big, and then presumably n log n, and then presumably the log. Any questions about that? Okay. Actually, let me put on my uh, mask, my official transparent mask. Hold on. So. Okay. Now let's look at the second problem. The second problem addressed whether or not it says an array is k-unique if it does not contain a pair of duplicate elements within k positions of each other. Okay? So we want to be able to test whether or not, if I say if an array is five uh, unique, are there any pairs of elements that are within a distance of five of each other? Copies, that's what the question is asking about. Now, there are, um, the, the heart of the problem is asking about uh, what is the time of such an algorithm? Um, some people started out by sorting all the numbers, at which point they are completely lost. Okay, you can't do, you know, we, we need to worry about the original order of the, the thing. Um, to f how can you find whether something is k-unique? Well, if you know what k you're looking for, which is what is being presumed here, the... You know, one question is, in the first window of size k, are there any duplicates? How can you tell if I have a, if this is the first k elements, okay, and this element is a 3, the kth element is a 3, how can I tell whether or not there's any duplicates right before it? I could check explicitly this element against each of the k positions before it. And if I see a duplicate, that means that I've got a pair that's closer than k. Okay? So, um, so what am I going to do for each of the one algorithm that runs in order kn time? Would it start from the first position, go to the n, then have a loop that goes from 1 to k to go before it, look whether there's a duplicate. Okay? And if you do that, that's an order kn algorithm. What is a better way of doing it? Well, you want to be able to do queries in general and maintain it. What if we use a data structure? What if we use a balanced binary search tree to maintain the window of which k elements are uh, the k elements before this spot? If I build a bi balanced binary search tree, that's going to have height log k. What am I going to do? In general, I'm going to take the next element and ask, is this element already in the search tree? If it's in the search tree, I've got a duplicate. If it's not in the search tree, what am I going to do? I am going to delete the element, k elements before, and add this one to the window. So by using a combination of insert, delete, and uh, search, I can go and do this test in log k time. And that gives me an n log k um, algorithm for this. Any questions? Does anybody have any other algorithms that they think are fast for this? Some of you may say, I've got an n log n algorithm for it. Is that correct? Well, n log k is the winner. OK? So n log k is the fastest algorithm for this. In general, is there a faster way to do it? 
Well, if k was equal to n, so let's say we wanted to know whether there were any duplicates at all, that problem is basically something that's reducible to sorting. Maybe, maybe that's not clear to you. We had a lower bound for sorting. So certainly for large k, you can't do better than this, okay? But for small k, this becomes a linear algorithm instead of an n log n algorithm. Any questions? The next part asked, is there a, um, give me an expected time algorithm. Well, the expected order n algorithm is what if I use a hash table to uh, maintain this thing, okay? Now, again, I've got to maintain the neighborhood. What if I have a hash table, let's say, with k buckets, okay? Generally, what am I going to do? I'm going to insert something, you know, uh, my, my first k elements will be inserted here, okay? Um, in general, what will I do? I will take the next element and look on the list corresponding to this element. Is it in sort, you know, is it there? I may have to walk through all the elements on that list to explicitly check. If it's present, the thing, you know, I have found a pair within a distance k. If I haven't, I've got to delete the previous element from the array and insert the new one into the hash table. Delete the old one and uh, insert the new one. Okay, and if I do that right, that should take or constant time per operation or order n. Any questions? Any questions about this problem? So unless you have an n log k algorithm for the first part, okay, and an n bar algorithm for the second part, your answer is wrong. Any questions? Okay, the um, next one is on the h index. What is the H index? Okay, it says where, um, you know, my, my H index is H, okay, if it is, if I have at least H papers that have no more than H citations, okay? And the question is to find a, so you're given an array of the counts of my papers. I had one paper with two citations, seven, one, three, four, a hundred, six. What is my H index? Well, if I sort the papers, one, two, three, four, six, seven, a hundred, I have got at least one paper with at least one citation, at least two papers with at least two citations, at least three papers with at least three citations. I've got at least four papers with at least four citations. I do not have five papers with at least five citations. So my H index is going to be uh, actually one, two, three, four. It's not the number here, it's the rank of where it is. Okay? So, what is the algorithm for here? The right algorithm for this is basically sort it and then walk backwards through the sorted array counting. Is the ith value here bigger than i? The ith value from the right bigger than i. Where does that stop being true? Okay. This is going to be the time to sort plus the time to sweep, n log n to sort, and then the sweep. Any questions about it? Any other algorithms for this thing? Okay. There's a cute algorithm for thing here, which if you know, you can actually do this in order n time. Can anybody see how to do this in order n time? I don't know if anybody sees any kind of, yes? Do bucket sort. Well, what does bucket sort mean? You've got to be a little bit careful. You're saying if it's going to run in order n time, if you could sort these items in order n time, it would be fine. Um, well, what are the bucket sort could you do? Okay, you've got to be a little bit careful because these numbers could be very big. 
I happen to proudly say I have a, one, one of my papers been cited 5,500 times, okay? You could imagine an, a, a paper being cited a billion times. If your buckets are as big as the biggest number here, you couldn't use bucket sort, right? You know, God has a paper that's been cited, you know, infinite number of times, right? But what could you do? You could notice that if I have only written 200 papers, can my H index possibly be bigger than 200? So then you could sweep through this and say, is this number bigger than 200? If it is, why don't I just change it to 200? Okay? And now you've got small numbers and you could bucket sort it. Okay? But uh, if you just try the bucket, and then, then it's going to be fine. Sorting at numbers from 1 to n, okay? If you have n of them, can be done in linear time. Okay? Any questions? Okay? Okay. So those are the written parts of the problems. There are the multiple choice. Is there any multiple choice question that bothers someone in particular? And they really want to know how it's done. Going once, going twice, yes? 28 and 29 on what type of test? I like test version one. Are you test version one? You're two. What is the questions? Tell you what, bring your copy down here and r quickly run it down and show me this. Which are these two? Uh, 28. 28 and 29. This was my favorite ones here, okay? This is the one about how do you implement dynamic arrays. And this had a lot of people that got them wrong. That's one of the reasons I liked it. Um, but part of it is, I think, that if you really understand how dynamic arrays work, this kind of makes sense. So what is the question? What was a dynamic array? A dynamic array, if we remember correct, was this idea that we were going to keep an array, and we were going to fill it, fill it, fill it until it's full, and then recopy it at some point into another array. And if this gets filled, we get a bigger array and we recopy it and then fill it up that way. How much time does it take, depending upon, to do this, if you've inserted n items, depending upon the copying scheme? The first question says, what if we double the size of our array each time? Well, that's what the scheme I talked about in class is. And one of the great things about it is that if you double it every single time, you will go through log n doublings. But um, the total cost is going to be 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 dot dot dot. Okay? When you double these things, you know, the sum of this plus this is equal to this. The sum of this plus this is equal to this. One of the great things about the series, the exponential series like this, is that it converges. And if the biggest number at the end was of size 8, the total cost would be twice that. So this was order n for the first part. The second one says, what if instead of doubling it, I only each time enlarge it by 100 elements? Instead of doubling it next time, I add a hundred more elements. I add a hundred more elements. How many times will the first element be copied if we do this? If we start out with the array was of size x, let's say, let's say, let's say one just to be simple. On the hundred and first one, we're going to duplicate it. Then if we keep going, Add another 100. We're going to duplicate it, duplicate it, duplicate it. Every hundredth element t insertion, this element is going to get copied. This element is going to get copied n over 100 times. 
Okay? And in general, you know, n over 50 elements are going to get copied at least 50 times. This is going to be a quadratic thing. Okay? Any questions about why that's quadratic? Okay? What about the third part? The third part says, what if I use a balanced binary search tree to maintain the key of the element? Now I'm not really doubling it. I'm now using a balanced binary search tree. The height of this, I'm going to have a cell in my array, for every cell in my tree, for every um, node in the array. That's going to give me um, log n, you know, a tree of height log n. To look up the value here, I'm going to look up according to the index. To insert a new cell, I'm going to do an insertion here. If I used a balanced binary search tree, each operation is log n. That should be n log n. And finally, I said, what if you use a hash table instead of a binary search tree like that? So you're hashing on the index, okay? And you're going to store the item, you know, keyed with the index. Then, on average, every operation will be constant, and this would take order n time. Any questions? Any of you who are Python fans, this is how Python implements an array, is my understanding. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay? Any questions about anything else? If not, remember to take this up. Okay. If you were, did something right and it was marked wrong, what does that mean? If we added up your test wrong, okay, I, I am willing to take a look at that. If you say, no, I had the right answer, okay, but uh, my algorithm was 100% right, okay, but the TAs didn't, didn't see it, even though they looked extremely carefully and tried very hard to understand every paper. If so, then um, what I want you to do is to write a note on your front of your paper saying, my paper is right on this. Explain why you were right, okay, on the front cover and what you think we did wrong. We will take another look at it. But again, as I will tell the TA, if you happen to, in the course of looking at someone, discover that their wrong answer, that they say they had the answer right, and it wasn't the right answer, that's probably a sign they're confused. And maybe you gave them too many points the first time for partial credit. Is that clear? Okay, any questions? Okay, so at the end of class, give me your paper with a note on it. If we graded it, if you had a right answer, we graded wrong. Any questions? Yes? Um, the answer would be possible to know? Probably not. Doesn't matter because we graded that right. Okay? If you want to discuss it with one of the TAs at some point out of curiosity, what was the answer to this one? That's an intellectual question. You can have that discussion. Okay, any questions? Okay, if that's true, I'm going to say thank you. You can disappear. And I'm going to go and, uh, and start the lecture for today. Okay, thank you. So again, just as a final thing, if your scores were in the... No, let me, let me keep it. I'll keep it. Okay. Um, if your score was in the 20s or 30s, there is a serious problem. You may want to reconsider where you are in the class or, um, you know, or figure out how you're going to do differently because we're shifting to a new type of material. Um, any questions about that? Okay. What I now like to do is to shift to a new subject. Hold on. Boom. 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 And boom. Okay. What I'd like to now talk about are... Uh, Start, yes, question. How would you know what the curve grade is? Well, you wait until 
um, sort of December 20th or so, at the end of the semester, the, the, we will take oh, your, compute your final average, and we will curve that. Okay, I don't give you a grade for each assignment on that. But if you did better than the, if you did better than the, the, the median, you are probably above, greater than or equal to a B minus. If you did below it, you're greater than or equal, less than or equal to a B minus. Okay? And finer resolution, I don't want you to spend too much time obsessing about. Okay? You saw from the distribution I had up there that, uh, you know, roughly how many students were ahead or below of what you got. And that gives you some idea. Yes? Do you want the test back? No, I don't want the test back. Okay? I want you to keep the tests. Okay? Only if we happen to have graded one of your problems that was 100% correct, if we happen to have graded it wrong, then I would like to see it back with a note on it explaining what our, our sins were. Okay? But we do not expect very many of these. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay. Let's now change gears a little bit and start talking about graphs. What are graphs? Graphs are kind of, um, you know, the, 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 for the next, you know, three or four, three weeks or so, I want us to talk about graph algorithms. Graphs are kind of one of the, uh, you know, I will say great unifying ideas of computer science. Um, recognizing that uh, your problem that you're working on involves graphs is one of the, the biggest ways to find an algorithm for it. When you take a course like this, we're going to go over a certain number of classical graph algorithms, things like um, minimum spanning tree and shortest path. And quite often, your problem, which may have a different name, okay, which you may not know what to call it, if you look at it the right way, it's a classical graph problem. But getting to the point where you can look at a problem and see that, you know, really your application is a graph problem is an important skill in algorithms. So when it comes to the stuff we did in sorting and searching, which is, the, let's say, was the first unit, Many of the problems in life you encounter are basically clever applications of sorting or, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> data structures. With graph algorithms, it's often the case that your problem, if you look at it the right way, turns into a classical graph problem, okay? And being able to recognize that is one of the skills that I want to kind of teach you in this, cl in this class. Actually, again, we use my textbook. One of the th parts of my book that we don't go through, but that you should at some point, is the back of the book. The back of the book breaks all of the algorithm problems in the world, N not all of them, but uh, a large fraction of them, into like 75 different types of famous problems. And it's amazing with graph algorithms how often if you, somebody comes into me with an application, oh, I have a network and I got to do, find a thingamabob in the network. When you ask them what the thingamabob is, it'll turn out to be one of the classical problems. So learning how, what, how to talk about graphs and what you can do with them is an important skill. So what is a graph? A graph is a structure uh, which is defined by a set of vertices and a set of edges. Okay, the edges are depending upon the graph, either an ordered or an unordered pair of the vertices of uh, the graph. So here is a road network. Road networks are certainly graphs. What is it in this case? In the way I modeled this road network, every city in the network is a vertex, and there is a edge between any pair of roads a pair of cities that are connected by a directly by a road. Okay? Does everybody have to see this idea? Okay. Why would you care about a, a road network? Well, all of you guys, I was going to say, have a GPS. Actually, these GPS are probably Google Maps these days. Somewhere there is an algorithm that is capable of taking, saying, what's the fastest way from here to a particular pizza place in Brooklyn, okay? 
If we model the, uh, the, the map of the world by a road network, where you've got vertices represent junctions between roads, and um, edges represent pairs of junctions that are connected by a street, then finding the directions reduces to finding a path in the network between the two points. Any questions about road networks? Um, here's another example of something that is modeled by a graph. I use the word graph and network interchangeably. Okay, probably should use the word graph more. But, uh, you know, if you took, uh, you know, computers are actually made of electronics. You may or may not get that in your classes these days. But what is an electronic circuit? It is a bunch of, verti of, of, of electronic components, here resistors and capacitors, that are wired together. I claim any circuit can be thought of as a um, graph. What are the vertices and what are the edges of this graph? Okay, it turns out there are a couple of different ways to look at it. Who has a way of looking at it, yeah? One graph would be to view each vertex as a component, uh, as a, as a um, component. And then you're going to have an edge of what? If there's a direct connection. So from here to here, here to here, right? I guess I've got to create another one out here. Does everybody see that that's actually, I guess, a, uh, what you call it? Is there any other connections that should be there? I guess, is there a direct connection between this and that? Maybe. Okay. So one way to do it would be to imagine that there is a, each vertex is a component. The alternative is to think of it like the railroad map. You could think of each junction as a component. And then each vertex, each junction, each junction is a vertex, and each edge represents a component. Okay? Sometimes it's better to look at it one way, sometimes it's better to look at it another way. Okay? Any questions? Do you guys learn Kirchhoff's laws these days for circuit design? I think that has to do with looking at it this way. You're looking for loops in the network, right? And uh, the voltage adds up to zero, if I remember correct, or something like that. Kirchhoff happened to have been a graph theorist, or there's several things in graph theory that are due to him. Um, what other graphs or networks do you encounter in life? Okay. One of the great things about graph, graph data is that, when you, that there's a lot of things in the world that are really represented by graphs if you think about them the right way. Is there anything else in your life that is a graph or a network? I have to believe you do not lead graph-free lives. Does anybody else have any graphs or networks they deal with? Yeah? Computer network. What is a computer network? What are the vertices and what are the edges? So the vertices, I would think, when I think of computer networks, I'd say that there is a, each computer or server or component is probably a vertex. And whenever there is a direct link between two components, either a wired link or perhaps a wireless link that I am connected to you, okay, that would be an edge, okay? So yes, computer networks are graphs and networks. Is there anything else in your life that is a network? Yeah. Sort of lots of the class. I guess like the different classes that you go to, computers, very technical class, you take the classes. Okay, so you, you're saying that there is a, a, a network of buildings. Okay, you're saying the vertices are buildings. And what is an edge? Okay, so let's, let's, be, let's be careful here, okay? A edge I want to be is an elementary chunk of connection. 
An edge is a connectron. It's the smallest unit of connection that you can have. Okay? You were talking about paths between classes. Paths are composed of multiple hops of edges, right? So when you're building, like, let's say the GPS, if you're thinking about Google and maintaining your GPS, Google does not store all paths between places because there's too much. But they store all the elementary connections. Those are the edges of the graph, and they make paths from that. Any other edges, graphs, that people deal with in life? Yes? Like social networks. Social networks. Some of you guys have heard of Instagram or something like that? What is Instagram? Okay. Or I'm not completely sure, but I believe that it's something where every person is a vertex and every person is connected to their friends. Presumably, what a social network is, every person is a vertex, every edge is a friendship, right? And that's what defines Facebook or Instagram, okay? Any questions about that? Is there anything else in the world that is a network or a graph that you deal with? Okay, I mean, I have my favorite examples here. What else did we have? One thing that's true is the World Wide Web. Okay, if you have a web page, what does a web page do? A web page links to other web pages, is that correct? There's hyperlinks. The vertices of the web graph are the individual web pages. The edges are any hyperlink, connects one web page to another. Okay, the web is best thought of as a uh, graph. Has anybody ever heard of the flow graph in a computer program? You guys write computer programs. What happens in a computer program? One statement follows the other, follows the other, follows the other, until you get to an end of a loop or a if statement. You can kind of imagine a program, a, a graph, where every vertex is a line of code, and there is an edge between one line of code and the next one. If you can, um, if, if there's a way you can go from this to the next line as a, the next step, okay? So if it's, you know, if there's a condition, if you have an if statement, um, you know, what is it? I've got a line, if something, then this, this line can go to that, this line can go to this or that line, okay? And analyzing programs as graphs is a very important thing for, for compiler optimization, finding dead code, all kinds of different things. Any questions? So seeing when something is a graph is a very, very useful skill. Any questions? Okay. Another thing that's a useful skill is recognizing that graphs come in different flavors. We're going to talk about different types of graphs here. But that there are certain properties of graphs that, uh, that are important enough algorithmically that we are often going to talk about them, okay? And knowing what kind of graph you have in any application is critical to finding the right data representation, the right algorithms for it, asking the right questions about it, okay? So it's important to understand the vocabulary when dealing with graphs or, uh, or not, okay? So the first question I ask whenever I have a network or a graph, is whether it is connected. What is a connected, what not a connected? The first thing I ask is whether it's directed or not. In a directed graph, okay, a graph we say is undirected, if edge x comma y implies that y x is also in the graph. Okay? So um, this graph, every edge has an arrow on it. Right? That arrow kind of signifies direction. This is a directed graph. Okay? Edges that go both ways are an undirected graph. 
Okay? Is Facebook a, a directed graph or an undirected graph? Or Instagram, you guys may know about Instagram. I think it's the same thing. Is it directed or undirected? Somebody, yeah? You say it's undirected, why is it undirected? If I am your friend, you are my friend, right? Does everybody agree with that? If they enforce that, then, then Facebook and Instagram is an undirected graph. Is Twitter a directed graph or an undirected graph? How many people have you seen Twitter? Who knows anything about Twitter? Okay, is it directed or undirected? Yeah? Directed. directed. Why is it directed? Right, okay, I'm proud to say 2,500 people follow me. I follow 12, okay? And I don't really look at them, okay? I don't read it, okay? So it's directed, okay? I encourage you guys to follow me. I won't follow you. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay? What about, let's just think of some other graphs. Is the web graph directed or undirected? The graph directed, you know, the web graph thing. Web pages, is that directed or undirected? Yeah? Directed. My web page links to somebody else. They don't have to link back to me, do they? Right? Everybody links to Google. Google doesn't, Google's homepage does not link to me, right? So, so what about road networks? Are road networks directed or undirected? You say undirected. Who said undirected? Okay. Well, road network, who here says directed? Okay. My guess is you. Why do you say directed? If you have a one-way street, I can drive on this edge, and it's not, I can drive, you know, in Manhattan, there are one-way streets. Well, you say undirected. In Long Island, the world is basically undirected. If I can drive on a road from me to you, from X to Y, usually you can drive from Y to X. Okay? So I think it's fair to say that when you have road networks between cities, they are undirected. Okay? In that, if you can drive to a city, you can usually drive home. Right? But on the other hand, in city streets, you often have one-way signs. And one-way signs, may, th th that's an edge that you can only traverse in one direction. That's a directed graph, okay? Now, what was the clarification, the question you were raising? Two-way streets. You're saying, can a two-way street be thought of, if, if everything was a two-way street, is that a directed graph or an undirected graph? You could say that the network, suppose let's say I had an edge like this. I had an edge like, oops, bad news. I had an edge like this, like this, like this, like this. Is that directed or undirected? Okay. I say that it is an undirected graph if edge XY implies YZ. So if you really double all these edges, I would call that an undirected graph at that point, okay? But uh, at least conceptually. But usually that's the wrong way to represent it. Usually you represent it with undirected edges, okay? Some algorithms work on directed graphs. Some world algorithms work on undirected graphs, as we'll see. Any questions? Yeah? Is there ever a mix between the two of them? It turns out that there is a kind of graph called a mixed graph that has both um, directed edges and undirected edges. Um, algorithmically, these are a pain in the neck to deal with. And uh, generally speaking, I, you know, generally speaking, you don't really, uh, you won't really see them. 
But if you read a good enough draft book, they'll tell you about mixed graphs, okay? So I guess conceptually they can occur. But usually I would then, rec usually the right answer then is to think of them as directed graphs, where you do have some back edges. Any questions? Okay, what else can I tell you? Another big distinction among graphs is whether a graph is weighted or unweighted. Okay, in a weighted graph, every edge, typically we have edge-weighted graphs, every edge has a number associated with it. Um, in an unweighted graph, the edge does not have a number associated with it. Okay, so um, let's think about it. Is Facebook or Instagram, is that a weighted graph or an unweighted graph? Somebody. Facebook, yeah? Unweighted, unweighted right? You're his friend, okay? How much are you or his friend? That isn't being asked. You might have imagined that, you know, you could rate how strong your friendship was and have that be a weighted graph, but that's not what they do. Are road networks weighted or unweighted graphs? Okay. Yeah. You say weighted. What are the edge weights? So the answer is, it, I would say, is it depends what you want to do with it. If you want to have a GPS system, okay, and measure, find the shortest path between things, then a natural thing is to weigh each edge according to its length or its travel time, right? And so in, in the context of road networks, if you're using it for transportation, then it probably makes a lot of sense, you know, for, for trying to plot the shortest route, then that makes sense. There might be other weights that you might have. You might have a weight on each edge corresponding to, is there a toll on the road? How much do you have to pay for the toll? That could be an alternate weight, right? So depending upon what you're trying to do, there might be a, uh, you know, might have the speed limit. That might also be something you're interested in, okay? Some graphs are weighted, some graphs are unweighted. And some of the problems we're going to see in this class are either weighted problems or unweighted problems. Any questions? There are another distinction that you should be aware of if ever you're implementing a real graph algorithm is there is a difference between whether your graph is simple or not simple, okay? In a simple graph, we assume that every, um, what you call it, every edge links two different vertices and there is only one of them, okay? So in a simple graph, okay, there is at most one edge between any pair of vertices, okay? In a, you know, non-simple graph, you can have two kinds of weirdness. You can have a self-loop, or you can have multi-edges, okay? Two edges between the same point, okay? And whether you do or not depends on your application. Can you have a multi-edge? Let's just think about it. Can you have a multi-edge in the Facebook Instagram graph? Can you be a friend of somebody twice over? Okay. According to Facebook, you can't. Mark Zuckerberg says you can't. You can only be, have one edge between you. But maybe you know someone from Skeena's class, and before that you were in the same high school. Okay. You could imagine multiple ways of being friends. If you wanted to model that, you might naturally have a, a uh, multi-edges. Okay? In Facebook, are you allowed to be your own friend? Okay? If you were allowed to be your own friend, that would be a self-loop. Okay? Is that possible? Well, I don't think Mark Zuckerberg says it's possible, but um, sometimes there's worlds where you do have multi-edges. 
Any questions? And dealing, we're going to, in general in this class, assume that there's no multi-edges. But note that non-simple graphs can occur. Um, remember back to this? Okay, everyone remember this? Does anybody see a multi-edge? Okay, does everybody see that if I modified, if I had the junction representation of a graph, there are two edges between A and B, right? One had a resistor, one had a capacitor, okay? So this is, again, these can possibly happen when you're thinking about modeling your thing as a graph. It's important to understand what the space of possibilities is. Any questions? Let me just erase this. This is not doing so well here today. The other, the last distinction I'm going to give you today, uh, maybe I'll give you two more, between um, graphs that we're going to see in this class, a very important distinction is between sparse graphs and dense graphs. Sparse graphs are ones where, okay, if you have a simple graph on n vertices, how many different possible edges are there? If I have a graph on n vertices, here n is equal to 5, how many edges can there be? Okay, at most. Somebody. Yeah? What? n minus 1 edges? Well, there can be n minus 1 edges from one vertex to all the other vertices. Right? Does everybody agree that this has n vertices? and it has n minus 1 edges, is it possible to have more edges than that? How many edges can you have in the, in the densest possible graph on n vertices? Well, you have n minus, well, how many? It would be n minus 1 plus n minus 2. Let me see if we can get a bigger, a darker pen. I don't even have a color here. Maybe I'll take that up. It would be n minus 1 plus n minus 2 plus dot, 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 up to 1. What is that going to be? Well, yeah, how much? N times n minus 1. Yes, so what is it? We have, um, on average, if we sum this thing up, this is going to be n minus 1 plus 1 is n. n minus 2 plus 2 is n. We've got something like n over 2 pairs, each of which accounts for a total of n edges. You get something like n squared edges. In fact, it's n times n minus 1 over 2. Also, it depends whether you have self-loops or not. That might may add another n. But a dense graph is going to be quadratic. Okay? Any question about that? A sparse graph is going to have a linear number of edges, okay? And knowing whether or not your graph is dense or sparse is a critical thing in picking the right data structure for it. Ah, this is what I wanted. So tell me something. Is the Facebook graph sparse or dense? Or the Instagram graph, is it sparse or dense? How many edges do we think if there are n people on Instagram? How many friendships are there? Okay. Total friendships does Mark Zuckerberg own? Yeah? Well, would it be something where this is the complete graph. We say that a graph is complete if every pair of edges is connected. Is this what the, face, the Instagram looks like? Is everybody friends of everybody else? Certainly not. How many friends on average do you think the average person on Instagram has? Okay. I usually say, well, is it one? Is it 10? 
Is it a hundred? Is it a thousand? Is it ten thousand? Is it a hundred thousand? Where do we think the, the, the cutoff is? What do you think the average number of people on Instagram is? Friends. Okay, I'm not on Instagram, but I have an idea. I'm pretty sure it's somewhere between a hundred and a thousand. Does that sound about right? So this tells me that Instagram has 1,000, at most 1,000 N edges. Okay? Instagram is a sparse graph. Does everybody kind of see that? Most pairs of people, if you pick two people at random in the world, it's almost certainly they're not friends with each other, right? What about road networks? Are road networks sparse or dense graphs? Yeah? You say dense. Why is it dense? Do you think that every junction is con directly connected to every other junction? Or is it that there's a path between every other junction? This is an important distinction to make. Remember, we're thinking about edges as the elementary chunk of connectivity. Paths are long chains of friendships, uh, of, 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 of chunks. In a typical road network, let's go back to the world road network. What does a road network look like? There's a road network. Is a road network going to be that there's a direct connection between place, uh, lots of pla pairs of places or relatively few pairs of places? What do people think? Yeah? Few. Okay? When you have a junction in the road network, in the city, if I have a junction... How many other junctions am I directly connected to in Manhattan? Four. Does everybody agree that? What if Broadway cuts through this? Now it's six, right? Maybe like, what is it? That's around uh, Madison Square, I think, has Broadway cuts at fifth. It's a big mess, right? But can you have too many roads meet in the same junction? Just, as, you know, just by conserving the angles thing. There's no way you can have too many roads meet in any junction. On my webpage, I have the biggest, the densest, the worst junction, traffic junction in the world with something like 12 roads meeting at the same point. You can't have 100 roads meet at the same point because, you know, roads just can't get that thin. Okay? So does everybody see that road networks are sparse? Okay? Can anybody think of a graph that is dense? Okay. That may be harder for you now to do. Okay. When is a graph dense? Well, if we have a, a similarity graph where we're comparing every pair of objects in here and have an edge if you two are kind of similar, that kind of thing might be dense, right? If we had an edge comparing every person in the graph and we said, you know, well, almost certainly one of you is a computer science major and so is the other, you're probably similar, right? So what's the point? Dense graphs have every edge pair connected or almost, or a high fraction connected. Sparse graphs have only a linear number of connections. If your graph is sparse, you can use a better data structure on it. Any questions about that? Okay. Let me move on and skip a couple of things because I'm a little bit behind. Um, and again, I, I talk about various properties of the, uh, the um, you know, of friendship graphs. Again, I want to make sure that there's a, it's clear what the difference is between an edge and a path. In the friendship graph, you can ask yourself, are you connected to President Biden? Okay? Now, I assume there's no one in here that is a, is a, is a, a friend of Joe Biden. And if they are, let me know. Okay? But I am proud to say I am the friend of a friend of Joe Biden's. Okay? 
And so that means that there's a path of length 2 in the network. Okay? And if you think about it, if you know 100 people, and each of those 100 people know 100 people, well, that might mean that there's a path of length 2 to you to 100 times 100 or 10,000 people, right? Um, I also have a path between me and Donald Trump that I know of, okay? That I have a friend who, you know, who, who, who knows Donald Trump, okay? Any questions about that? You see the difference between the, the elementary unit of connectivity, which is the friendship, and the path is, is there a way to, for, to get you through someone in that network? Any questions? Okay, fair enough. Okay. What I really want to talk about for the rest of the class, though, is to think about how you represent graphs in a computer. Okay, we're going to be spending the next uh, three weeks on graph algorithms. That means we need to be able to store a graph in a computer. Okay, and there are two data structures that matter. There's, there's, there's other ones that people use, but there's two primary things that we're going to talk about. The adjacency matrix and the adjacency list. In an adjacency matrix, we're going to represent an n vertex graph by an n by n matrix. Okay? So suppose, let's say, I have a four vertex graph. Ka chunk, ka chunk, ka chunk. One, two, three, four. Hopefully I can write it. One, two, three, four. Let's say my graph was one, it's connected to two, two is connected to three. 2 is connected to 4. What is my ne net road going to be? Vertex 1 is connected to one, uh, 2. Let me make this a different color. That's a 1 there. 2 is connected to vertex 1 and 3 and 4. Vertex 3 is connected to vertex 2. Vertex 4 is connected to 2. Does everybody kind of see what I've done? Every edge is going to be, there's one, two, three edges. Every edge is represented twice in the matrix. Edge 2, 4 is represented by the fourth element of the second row or the second element of the fourth row because this is an undirected graph, right? So I'm going to represent my, my, my graph by a matrix. And it's going to have a 1. Element ij is going to have a 1 if there is an edge there, and a 0 if it's not there. Any questions about an adjacency matrix? Can I represent a, a weighted graph using an adjacency matrix? How would I represent a weighted graph? What's the weight of ij? Where am I going to store it? Yeah? One thing, if the weight was uh, non-zero, I could have a, uh, if the weight was a distance, I might have it be a number, 15. Right? And maybe instead of having a zero for there not being there, maybe I'd use minus one to show that it wasn't there. Right? Okay. Can I represent um, self-loops with an adjacency matrix? Where are the self-loops? How do I represent self-loops? Well, that's an edge from vertex i to vertex i, right? That's exactly the cells in the diagonal of this matrix. If I put a 1 there, I've got a self-loop. How do I represent two copies of an edge from i to j? Well, I can't use the weights to represent 2. I could use the weights to represent how many copies if I didn't want to have them represent, it, you know, the weights uh, in something else. Okay? But that's not important. Does everybody see that we can store an n by n matrix, an n vertex matrix, in an n by n matrix, where if I have m edges, I've got, if it's undirected, 2m1s in the matrix and the other n squared elements, minus m, 
are going to be zero. Any questions? Okay. Now what's bad about an adjacency matrix? Suppose I had Facebook. Suppose there is some disease out there and people start unfriending each other. And maybe Mark Zuckerberg is friends with his wife, but nobody else is friends with anybody. What would we have? We would have a graph with 3 billion edges, 3 billion vertices. By 3 billion vertices would be the matrix. There would be exactly one edge that would be a 1-1 one, one in this 3 billion by 3 billion matrix. Does everybody see that if the graph is sparse, the adjacency matrix is bad? Okay, if I have n edges, well, if my, and n vertices, well, my space is going to be n squared with an adjacency matrix. Okay? So adjacency matrices are good things if the graph is sparse, is, is dense. But for sparse graphs, a better representation is the adjacency list. We're going to use the adjacency list for almost everything. So I want us to make sure we understand this thing. What is the data structure for an adjacency list? Here we've got a graph on n vertices. Here n is equal to 5. And it's an undirected graph. What are we going to do? An adjacency list consists of an array of n linked lists where the ith linked list is going to be a linked list of all of that vertice's neighbors. Okay? So what is on the list, the fifth element of the list? Our array goes from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We can look at the fifth linked list. And the fifth linked list here contains vertex 1, Vertex 2 and vertex 4. Does everybody see that? All the neighbors of vertex 5 are in the list of vertex 5. What are the neighbors of vertex 2? They are 1, 5, 4, and 3. So does everybody see how we represent our graph? We treat it as an array of linked lists of neighbors. OK? Any questions about what the linked list representation looks like? OK? Um, how many times is any, if we have an undirected graph, how many times is each edge going to appear in the adjacency list data structure? There's an edge 2-5. Where does edge 2-5 appear in the adjacency list data structure? Okay, yeah? It should be in the second linked list. And because it's undirected, it's also going to be in the fifth linked list. Does everybody see that? So let's go through and think about this. Suppose I want to, if I have an adjacency list, what happens if I want to add a new edge? Suppose I have an edge, okay, I um, one three. How do I insert edge 1, 3 into my adjacency list data structure? What do I got to do? I've got to add, go on to list 1 and insert an element 3 into that linked list. And then what else? I got to go to 3 and insert a 1. Uh, why don't I just, because I'm lazy, and I want to do it, I'll put it at the end. Does everybody see this? Okay. The order of the elements on the list doesn't really matter. Okay. 
What if it's a directed graph? Suppose I want to insert a directed edge, 1, 3, into the graph. What did I have to do then if I wanted to insert a directed edge, 1, 3? Yeah? I would only do the first part. I wouldn't have done this part, right? Okay. How do I test whether or not edge... Suppose I want to know whether edge 3, 5 is in the graph. How do I test whether edge 3, 5 is in the graph? Yeah? I go to the third list, and I then walk through it and say, are you 5? Are you 5? Nil? I couldn't find the 5. Edge 3, 5 doesn't exist. Was there another way to tell if undirected edge 3, 5 was in the graph? Yeah? Yeah. Could go to the fifth list. Are you at 3, 3, 3? No. Which one is better, to search the fifth list for three or the third list for five? Well, if you knew the degree of the vertex, meaning the length of the list, you might know. But if you don't know the degree of the list, then you don't know, right? Sometimes it pays to also keep track of the degree explicitly, if you want to make that decision easy. How do we delete an edge from the graph? Suppose I want to uh, now delete edge, um, what you call it, delete the edge uh, 4 or 5 from the graph. What do I have to do to delete that edge? Okay. Yeah. I go to the fourth list and say, where is 5? Splice that out. Go to the fifth list, where is the four? Splice that out. Okay? Any questions? Okay? So what, any questions about how adjacency lists work? Okay? You are, for the next homework, going to have to program a little bit on them. You really have to understand how adjacency lists work. Which representation is better? An adjacency list or an adjacency matrix? If I want to know whether edge IJ is in the graph, which is better? I say a matrix is better. Why? Testing whether IJ is in there is constant time in a matrix. It's order the degree in a link in a, a um, an adjacency list. If I want to find what's the degree of a vertex, how many edges are on it? How would I find the degree of vertex I in an adjacency matrix? If I want to know what the degree of vertex I is, what do I got to do? I got to walk across the entire row of that matrix, bump, 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 and count how many ones I had. That was order N. In an adjacency list, how do I find the degree? I walk to the list, the length, I count how long the list is on the ith vert, for, for associated with vertex i. That would be order the degree, that's better than order n. Which uses small, less memory on small graphs, on sparse graphs? On adjacency list uses order n plus m space. Number of edges, plus the number of vertices. The number of vertices, was that array? The number of edge, each edge appeared as two elements on the linked list. The total number of elements is 2 times m. Okay? This is a big win compared to n, squ n squared, if the graph is sparse. If the graph is dense, it's about the same. Notice that the most edges you can have is n squared. If you have n squared edges, the adjacency list is going to take n squared space. Actually, there's pointers and other things, so if you really have a dense graph, you're better off with a matrix. Okay? Um, 
Any questions? The key thing is that for almost all problems we're going to see in here, adjacency lists are the right thing. Okay? Almost certainly the bigger thing with graphs is the space and storage more than being able to tell whether an edge is there or not quickly. Okay? So most of the algorithms in here, almost all of them, we're going to talk about are going to use adjacency lists. Any questions about that? Let me just try one last thing I want to show you quickly, and maybe I'll review this next class, but I want you to do it because it's part of the daily homework problem for, problem for next class. Look at how I implement adjacency lists. I'm going to walk through it in the next four minutes, but I want you to study this enough to do the daily problem tomorrow. What does a node look like in an adjacency list? Well, in general, I've got to have what is the number if I'm in an adjacency list. I need to know what, what if I'm in the ith list, edge ij, I need to know what is the other vertex. I need to have a pointer to the next node. And if I want to store any auxiliary information, I might also have a weight field. Okay. Any questions about what the nodes are in adjacency lists? Okay, what else do I know about them? Boom. Let me try this thing, sorry. How do I represent the graph in general? Each graph that I claim is going to have a number of vertices, n. I'm going to want, I may be curious to know how many edges are in my graph. I'm keeping that as a variable. I might want a flag to tell me, am I storing a directed graph or an undirected graph? Okay. But I might want to know the degree of every vertex. That's optional. The important point, the most important thing in my graph structure is that I am going to have an array of size n of linked lists. That's what the adjacency list is. In constant time, I can go to the, the, the edges associated with vertex i, because they are on the ith list of this thing. Any questions about that? Once you've got that, what else can I tell you about the implementation? Here's how I initialize a graph. It starts out as n0 